um, you know, that was great because the last question that Senator Daniel Biss had was the issue of local politics and the local impact. So this is really, really great. So um, we'll start off. So my name is Irfan Ibrahim. I uh, ran for Forest Preserve Commissioner position uh, for DuPage County District 3. And uh, I think that the, the point that brought me to realization that why local politics matter is because A, if the designated area is either red or blue, people stay off of it. So these local politics, the local chair offices, they almost stay into either family or they stay into the certain zip codes or they stay into certain religious institutions. So the, nobody knows about that these are positions that matter. So Forest Preserve Board, uh, I called actually my uh, cousin who's right here, Anisha, and I said, hey, I think I want to run for this uh, office. And first thing she said, yes, let's do it. And I was like, no, no, let's back it up. <laughs> we, 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 we need to reason this thing through. And uh, so she, she connected me to the three to five people and that led to the whole movement of almost 14 months of process, which was gruesome and not fun at all. I'm going to say very transparent. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, once I started doing the research, uh, it turns out the Forest Preserve Board in DuPage County budget is $82 million. There are six commissioners and a one president, six plus one, all seven of them were actually Republican. And the, uh, my opponent that I ran against uh, actually ran once unopposed, and she was the party chair of the Republican Party, so it was prized possession. So then I started doing more research. Turns out that they attend one hour a week meeting for 52 hours, and they pay themselves a salary of $50,000 and a $16,000 worth of health insurance for a whole entire family. And these are the positions that they give out to the loyalists establish certain institutional candidates and they keep the insular information out of the public. So what I was able to do, uh, and I brought all the attention to these issues, and the person, so two actually went unopposed. So there were three commissioner positions up for re-election, one I ran against, two went unopposed, and a Forest Preserve president. Turns out the night of election he lost, Daniel Hebriard. Three weeks later, all the mailings came in, and he won by 116 votes. So he received 178,000 plus, and his opponent received 170. So my point is that starting from the couch and bringing attention to this major price possession that stays in a certain community, certain group, or certain religious institution, <coughs> that's why the local politics matter and I run for public office. My name is Sadia Covert. Uh, thank you, Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition and Delara for having me here. Uh, I ran for DuPage County Board in District 5, which is Lyle, Aurora, and Naperville, and I just got elected and inaugurated last week. I have, thank you, I have been in office. I have been in office for two weeks now and already making very difficult decisions. It wasn't going to be easy, that's why we get paid the big bucks. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, so how I got involved, um, I want to go into, you know, just echo Senator Biss that local office is where you make that direct impact. You have direct uh, contact with constituents and people and you feel like, you know, these are real issues and on county board there are so many issues, there's so many different committees. Um, we just received our committee assignments and um, I can't wait to you know, roll up my sleeves and get started on all the work that needs to be done. And um, so it felt a little overwhelming the first week, like, oh my god, how are we going to get through this? But you know, with a good team, and um, we can get through this. My race, um, I want to talk a little bit about the blue wave, because everybody's talking about the blue wave, and there was a huge hit. you know. And my campaign manager, um, who is also a millennial, <laughs> We're all millennials. I'm on the uh, elderly millennial end. Uh, but we were talking about the blue wave and we were looking at our numbers on election night. I was 1800, about 1800 votes behind my 
Democrat seatmate who was first on the ballot, so that gives a 1% boost. And then I was only 221 votes apart from my Republican opponent, okay? I was trying not to freak out because that bar, <laughs> I was like, are we gonna make it? Are we gonna make it? It was a really close race. A week later, we counted more provisional ballots and mail-in ballots, and I was 878 votes ahead of her. So really safe, alhamdulillah. Um, but looking at that, we're like, okay, were we really hit with the blue wave? So we looked at the other districts who ran for DuPage County Board. We looked at Hadia's district, we looked at Zara's district, and we looked at we looked at all the districts. So we had three people, three districts where they were running two candidates. Um, two Democrats and two Republicans, and then we had two, uh, three of those, and then we have all minority, by the way, these, one of them, uh, all three districts had at least one minority. Hadia, my good friend Hadia, Zara, and uh, Erica Green. So the other two districts only had one solo Democrat running. Now what we noticed was a pattern. We noticed that the two solo Democrats got in. There was one Democrat and one Republican, two seats. But for the three other ones, the top balloted Democrat got in and, um, and another Republican, and there was a split. Now District 5, my district was supposed to be like that too. I'm an anomaly. But because we strategize differently, and I honestly give a lot of you know, credit to, just like Daniel Biss, Senator Biss said, fortune, <laughs> uh, blessings, you know, prayer, whatever, you know. Um, I was really close. And what got me over that hump, what we had to do in that race, I had to knock, now I was up against three women who had run twice, at least two or three times before. People told me, there were people who told me Sadia, you can't win. Your name is Sadia and you're brown. It's not gonna happen. You can't compete with a white, blonde-haired woman. Women, you just can't. And then Secretary of State Jesse White told me, if anybody tells you that, you look at them in the eye and say, watch me. So, so I ran. And, but it took, I'll tell you what it took. It took over $35,000 about six or seven mailers, okay, these are expensive, uh, not one but two billboards in my district, huge four by four signs and papering the land with signs, yard signs, and knocking on 80,000 doors. Just to be 221 votes apart from my Republican opponent. That's what it took. Was I hit with the blue wave? No. No, I was not. <laughs> was Hadia hit with the blue wave? No. The blue wave left out some people. And we noticed the pattern. So what I'm saying to you is, Congressman Roger Christian Murthy gave me a very good piece of advice before my campaign. He said, do not think that just because you're a Democrat, you're going to get all the Democratic votes, votes automatically. Okay? You have to earn your votes. You have to work for them. I did not get all the Democratic votes. I was 1,800 less. Most of my, a lot of my votes came from the other side, Republicans. So, you gotta work for every vote and earn your vote. And all these candidates up here, Bushra, Javier, Irfan, they worked really hard and aggressive campaigns. And thank you for your leadership in making a difference in our communities. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Hadia Afsal, Assalamu alaikum. Um, first of all, thank you to Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition for having us. It's a really exciting space to be in, um, especially after the huge gains we made you know, up and down the ticket um, on November 6th. Um, like Sadia mentioned, I also ran uh, for a DuPage County Board seat in District 4, which is Glen Ellen, Wheaton, um, and then Glendale Heights, a little bit of Lombard. So we have a mix of majority white, affluent suburban areas, and then also some minority uh, poorer areas. And so I got involved in politics, I'm only 19 years old, and I ran 
at 17. So I wasn't legally allowed to collect signatures for two weeks because I wasn't old enough to have them notarized. Um, so I depended a lot on you know, precinct committee people, um, township Democrats, and I think that's one of the biggest lessons I learned while running is that you can't do it alone. Um, the whole point of running for a local seat is about, it's about your community, about the people you know, your neighbors, um, the, your former classmates, people who live next to you. And so you have to garner your support and build a coalition from those people. I could not have done it alone. Um, we came pretty close though, 22,000 votes for a 19-year-old first-time brown Muslim college student candidate is pretty good. Um, and, we <laughs> um, and you know, yeah, we were told that we couldn't do it, um, but it was more an absence of support that we felt. Um, and it wasn't malicious or intentional, it just wasn't there. And so it actually forced us to be stronger um, and for us to build it all on our own. Uh, with out outside support from people who weren't in an entrenched party structure. A lot of activist groups sprung up after 2016 and we helped, we used them um, to our advantage. We partnered with them, we walked with them, uh, we canvassed with them, door knocked, phone banked, and that showed me the importance of local politics because again, it's about a community local effort. Um, we focused on issues that affected people at a national level but scaled it down to a local neighborhood level. Um, you know, people my age are concerned about climate change, their futures, college debt, and we made them realize that, you know, you can start affecting that <coughs> on a local scale. We have a huge community college in um, the middle of my district. I live down the street from it, College of Page. And so emphasizing the fact that, you know, we don't have dorms at a community college. People commute to class. People are backed up in traffic jams, and that causes, you know, a lot of pollution um, and fumes all the time. And if you care about climate change, wouldn't you rather have a better public transit system? And so by building people's stories into issues, we're able to like actually bring people who weren't engaged in politics before back into the process. And I think that was the most empowering thing about running for a local office. It was about realizing that you can actually make people care because <coughs> these are the concrete issues that matter to them every day. You know, there are different kind of politicians who go to DC. There are pothole politicians who are the district. Um, uh, there are political politicians who go there to climb the ranks, and there are policy ones who just focus on certain areas in Congress. But those pothole politicians, they start at a local level. You can be a pothole politician who works for your community. And I think that's why it's important for Muslim people to run for office, for people of color to run for office, uh, and fact, run ourselves and to support people who do. Because, you know, in our community, it isn't really the done thing, especially the first few generations when you get here, you know, it's keep your head down, uh, build a stable community, build a stable family, um, and then maybe you can become a lawyer instead of a doctor. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's about encouraging and nurturing the entrepreneurial spirit of someone who wants to go down a different path. Because I, didn't, I couldn't have done this without my family support, without my community support, and I think, honestly, it's pretty rare to see a person like myself so supported. I didn't hear a negative word from my community, which I thought was incredible. Um, nothing but support. And I think that's what we can do together here in this room, is to build a platform to support others um, for them to run on. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Bushra Amiwala. I uh, ran for the Cook County Board of Commissioners. So. Um, unlike my friends over here, I'm over in Cook County, um, but the suburban side of it. So my district was Evanston, Skokie, Morton Grove, Nile, so that area. So is anyone even from that area here? Because I didn't think so. I didn't see it when I saw Okay, that's what I thought. I saw like two people. Yeah. <laughs> so that actually reflects sort of like the Muslim population we have in that district. Although it's large, I don't think it's as um, engaged and organized as this area is. However, I think um, my loss on election night changed that. So I compare um, my campaign to sort of what happened with Bernie Sanders' race. So when Bernie Sanders was running, um, you know, in 2016, he, uh, for example, you know, got all the youth support, all the young millennials were so excited for him, but a lot of them didn't vote. But they were like talking about him on social media, they were taking photos with him, they were showing up to his marches and rallies and events and supporting him, but they didn't go out and vote for him, right? So he lost. So all of those people woke up and thought, oh, during the general election, we'll be there, we'll vote then. Similar, kind of similar story, I had identified around 10,000 eligible Muslim, South Asian, and minority voters who we were like, we are going to target these people. 
because these people in the past have not been paid attention to. So let's see what happens when we pay attention to them. And people in the political community laughed at me. They're like, Bushra, there's a reason why people haven't paid attention. They're like, those people do not matter. Those people won't vote for you, and they won't vote against you. And they won't donate a single dollar to your campaign. And similar to, and similar to what Sadia was saying, I was like, watch me. But I like, still didn't work. But I said that, you know, I like, went in with super high hopes and everything. And on election night, you know, I lost. I came in second in a three-person primary. And later on, we were looking at the numbers. We're like, what happened? I personally registered over 3,000 of those people to vote. I had an event with just the South Asian community, and we served biryani, right? It's like, what does it take to get people to come? It was free. We didn't charge anyone. We're like, listen, I'm not asking for donations. I'm just registering you to vote and giving you a card with your polling place on there and where you should go for early voting. Made it super easy hosted all these early voting parties as well, also with free food. I was like, what does it take to get them to come out to vote? I found, after election night, that 600 of them voted. That's 6%, all right? And many of them saw my dad at the mosque and stuff, and they're like, oh, we heard what happened to Bushra, this and that. And they were like, man, like, if I knew the race was that close, I would have voted. <laughs> I was like, no way, of course that's what you say. But the thing is, since I was focusing so heavily on that population, and traditionally most candidates have not, they thought I was the only person in the race, right? Like they didn't realize what the odds up against me were. Um, but come November, although I lost in the March primary, most of those people then voted in November. And that's what that looks like. So that's why to me it's like my loss is what took people from that community to take it the next step further. So now, for example, when I was running, um, there's a local Muslim in my community called the Muslim Education Center. Super large, um, you know, Muslim population, Muslim community, so about like 500 people come for Friday prayer there. So I wanted them to, one, let me host a voter registration table, and two, to announce that I'm running after Friday prayer. I was like, don't say vote for me, just say pay attention, like a Muslim youth is running, right? Like playing up like that card. Like, <laughs> uh, and they're like, no, we can't do that. We're a nonprofit, we're 501c3, we can't do that. I was like, okay, let me host a voter registration drive. They're like, no, we can't do that. We're 501c3. And I was like, that's not true. You can definitely do this. <laughs> so I went. I went to four board meetings once a month for four months. And finally, in February, I got approval a month before my primary election. <laughs> I was like, all right, let's do what we can. Did that. Um, they announced my name during Jumma prayer, and we had a voter registration drive. It was great. I was like, this is amazing. Like, people are registering to vote. They're asking, like, who's this Bushra Amiwala girl? And if I register to vote, will I be called for jury duty? And I'm there like, I'm that Bushra Amiwala girl. And no, you will not be called for jury duty if you vote um, by any means. But what happens was sort of the uphill battle I was facing during my primary, that didn't stop just because I didn't get elected. Starting August, August 24th was National Muslim Voter Registration Day. I hosted voter res registration drives at three of the local masjids, and then every day, every Friday since then, hosted those drives because it wasn't about me running and voting for me and getting me elected. But I'm not gonna lie, it started with that. That's where like the, you know, that's kind of what like lighted the fuel. But I kept going despite my loss in August all the way to November, and still was like, let's keep voting, let's keep doing this, and now. We have another Muslim youth in our community who's running for something, and I was at Jumma prayer the other day, and they announced it. And it's like, oh my god, like that's amazing. Like that's what this is, right? Like it's like how can all of us, despite whether we win or lose, pave the way to make it easier? A year ago, there wasn't an event like this that was organized when we all were running, right? Like we wanted these resources, and we weren't doing it twice. So thank you to the Lara for like. It was how, one year ago. <laughs> I should do remember that. That's true. I guess like closer to the primary, I would say. But thank you to the Lord for making this so, I guess, like, for organizing all of us, for bringing us all t together, for connecting all of us. So I guess I don't even know where I just went with all of this, but it shows that whether you win or lose, like, this is where it all starts. This is what happens. And I'm just so honored to be on this panel next to these three amazing people. Um, and it's exciting to talk about campaigns and, uh, you know, getting involved civically and the impact that we all can have together. Great. Can you So, a question for you guys. It's a tough question. So, 
so this you know politics is all about coalition building. So I'm I'm glad that you know you uh, all went out in um, whatever coalition some of you want. How are your views on coalition building with the LGBTQT community? How do you feel? And I want your perspective. I know it's a double-edged sword. I know Muslim too. So you being seen on a panel with LGBTQ activists, uh, is it? How will you be viewed by your Muslim voters? And how do you guys personally believe about that? And where do you guys start? Yes. So, go ahead. Anybody? So I think my first take on, I ran on a forest preserve board, so everyone has a different story. It will not fit into <coughs> what answer is. I think in my personal view on that, that us as a Muslims, we think that we are in the snow globe and everybody's looking at us. That's the number one step of moving and uh, breaking that barrier. And specifically, when you are building a coalition in the community, so for example, uh, my community is currently going through a sterogenics issue. And I'm the guy who started the petition that collected 30,000 signatures, went to Governor Rauner's office, delivered those paper signatures in 26,000 page binder, like literally just handed to his office. So I think the cue, the, the eyes has to be on the issues. We cannot be focusing on that we are on the snow globe and people are watching us, <coughs> rather than how am I making better community, regardless of race, caste, gender, religion, or political alliance. Because as long as you are doing the right thing for your community, you are not there to represent your religion. That's why we have a separation of church and state. I am there to represent. I am not a leader of uh, Islamic movement. I am the leader of my forest preserve board or my school board. or my. So if you are looking at making your county better, school districts better, it should not be an issue. Because if I can go to work, and work with anyone because there are HR rules. We have HR professional here because at the end of the day, you respect each other for the humanity. And yes, I, I, I have no issues with that. So um, my dad was my Sunday school teacher. I tell everybody this. I come from a very religious household. My mom wears a headscarf. I know that for me is very religious. No, just kidding. Um, you know, my, my par I've been pretty much raised in, in a masjid, in a mosque. Fundraising, dinners, very active. I still am very active in the community. And um, people ask me this question, it's really interesting. Because one thing that uh, Islam teaches me is humanity comes first. And people are humans. So we don't look at people, as a Muslim, my, dad, my parents always taught me this, that as a Muslim you do not look at people for their gender or their sexual orientation or whatever it is. So when when people ask me LGBTQ, that's a non-issue to me because they're people. On my campaign, I had uh, one of my field uh, organizers was from the LGBTQ community. He was gay. <clears throat> Did that really make a difference in my campaign or how I felt about it? No, he was great. He worked hard and he's a person. Um, I do stand up for human rights, and I do stand up for, for them as well. Um, you know, I passed, uh, I co-authored the hate crime legislation that, that passed, and um, there was a group that had a problem. They're like, oh, is LGBTQ included? Well, are we going to discriminate and have people beat them up? Is that okay? No. You can't just single out any community. So LGBTQ <coughs> rights are just human rights. They're people. So, yes. Yeah, and I think maybe I come from a more liberal background as a younger Muslim as well. I mean, I have a ton of friends who are gay. Um, my campaign, like my, my, one of my best friends who um, like was on like my core team, she's from the LGBTQ community. I've known her since I was in middle school. Um, and so I've never had a problem reconciling the two. And like her father was saying, um, my faith only guides me in policy through its principles of empathy, and you know, understanding, and there aren't any prejudices I hold personally, and I would never bring them to any kind of public office either, um, because like Safi was saying, they're also just people first, and they have specific issues that are specific to their communities and their struggles, um, and you know what, they deserve to be heard just as much as any other persecuted minority, so. Okay. I shouldn't have said that kind of the panel. I knew that they'd say everything for me, but um, just echoing what was already said, as Muslims, we don't like it when people reduce us to just 
being a Muslim person and nothing else. So we just shouldn't treat other minority groups the same way. I really like what, I just want to comment what Hadia said right now. This is perfect because everyone's looking at religion right here, you know, and Islam right here and politics right here. But a lot of Muslims integrate their principles, the values that they take to make their decisions based on empathy and humanity and generosity. And I think that's what we learn from that. So I really like what you said. So thank you. Another question? Yes. Um, uh, I'm going to be the uh, common test between all the campaigns, uh, the campaign work that you guys have been doing, uh, have been questioned uh, uh, from your constituents with regards to what your position actually does or the body of government that you'd like to get into. Can you talk about um, maybe the benefits of using your campaign as a mechanism to expand civic literacy within uh, the Muslim community and, um, and how that could sort of, uh, and, and connect to people who, whether they're you know, historically apathetic or just generally just disconnected from, from politics and government, how you can sort of teach them to um, use the, you know, litany of avenues available to them to make their communities a better place. You can start with this. Um, so my district is primarily Wheaton and Glen Ellen, and we've never had a Democrat from the district ever. The first one only elected this past number. Um, but we also have historically underrepresented communities in our same district. Um, Glendale Heights, <coughs> Lombard, Carroll Stream, those majority um, Hispanic, uh, Latino, um, Muslim community as well. And so they've never had a politician knock on their door, let alone a local you know, county board seat person. And so seeing a, a girl with a headscarf show up at their door, all the aunties are like, come in, have some chai, like talk to me about your campaign. And I think having that community background to share with them and then jumping off of that point rather than just using it as a tool to get in, and like being genuine with those people about, hey, these are the issues being faced by the lack of representation on our current board. This is why we need people like me to be as a, to be an advocate for people like you. Because, you know, the biggest thing was being a good listener on the camp, on the trail, and asking people, you know, what issues are you facing? What issues is your husband facing? Um, how are your kids going to college? What are they doing in school? Uh, what problems are you having in the neighborhood? How can I help? And having someone who they can relate to makes them more involved. They want to talk to people like themselves because, you know, at the end of the day, we're all humans who want people on our side to be advocates for us. And then just having a representative who looks like them makes it even easier. Someone who can talk to them in Urdu at their doorstep is a huge difference from, like, just a white dude who never shows up. Uh, having someone who's there and can talk to them on like, a cultural level as well, it makes a difference. And just making the effort to show up in those neighborhoods, in those communities, and saying, hey, I'm here, those people aren't, so what can I do for you? That's the biggest thing. And that increases engagement, because people, they want to get involved if you give them the reason. So I'll, Brother Abdullah, sorry. Go ahead. One, no. There's a question back here, and yes. then um, Brother Abdullah. So I think the way I add it oh, to, okay. I, I'm just going to answer Brother's question, yeah. uh, that the what happened is when I started looking into before I ran, so now we are going to nuts and bolts of running. You decided what's going to happen, where the issues are. I started looking at the, so before this election at DuPage County, there are 18 board members. One of them was Democrats. 17 of them were Republicans. That's a $450 million budget at one board. And on a Forest Preserve board, there was an $82 million budget and no Democrat at all. Currently, Forest Preserve president is a Democrat. That is 82. So it's about $532 million question that one third of DuPage County is not represented. So again, uh, with the Senator Biss, I believe in data. I believe in numbers regardless. You strip down and then you look at it. So you happen to tell me that there are 950,000 people living, paying their taxes, and there's absolutely no representation at that level. And people literally kind of like, no, you're kidding me. I heard about the DuPage County is red. But I didn't realize that it was this bad. And I said, yes. So thankfully, now we have a seven <coughs> Democrats on that board, on a county board. And there's a Forest Preserve president who's a Democrat. So yes, we all can make a difference when you boil down to the basics information. Yes, no. I have a question for Sadia. With your race, how did you, you said you knocked 80,000 doors. <coughs> How was the response, and uh, what does the data show how many Muslims came out who never voted previously? 
So uh, my district's a little different. Um, the community that I come from, the Muslim community, we saw the data on how they voted, and it was not quite Democrat, <laughs> mostly. Um, and that's okay, you know, I, I don't judge people based on that. Um, so we did get more Muslims to come out this time, but I think there were many who split their vote between a Democrat and a Republican because they feel that Republicans are closer to their values. Um, there were interfaith leaders and community members who came up to my parents and said, did you know your daughter's running as a Democrat? And they said, yes, we know that. <laughs> so it was really confusing to them. Um, knocking on all these doors, um, I didn't do it alone. I had, I had a really good team. you know. And as I said before, Patrick Watson was one of my team people, so thank you forever <laughs> um, <clears throat> for helping me. Um, I didn't, honestly, I did not get a single negative response. I didn't, and I'm not, I'm not lying. I, like, there was no negative response because you go up to the door, you have a smile on your face, you know, they open the door and you introduce yourself and you're just yourself. So I didn't really get any negative responses. Um, there was one guy who I knocked on the door and he opened the door and he said, what's your party line? And I said, Democrat, and he slams the door shut. And I was just standing there not knowing what to do because I've never been through this before. And I'm like, okay. So he opens the door again immediately and he starts laughing. He's like, ha, 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 I'm just kidding. I would never slam the door. <laughs> yeah, so. And then we had a great conversation. He took my literature and he's like, I'm giving it to everybody at work. <laughs> so. Um. I guess my question, I want to kind of relate it back to the comments uh, Senator Biss and I to the panel. Uh, in terms of having this, in quotation, progressive vision, and you're knocking on doors to share that with people, what do you think was most effective to get people to buy into it? Because, like I said, he, he at least is my understanding what the comments is that not everybody brought this broad vision and they're looking at you know negative ads and, and other things influencing the voters. What things do you think you did that was successful in getting people to buy your vision? I had a unifying vision. I had a unifying message that everybody could get on board with. And I was just speaking from the heart when it comes to that because within my district, you know, just like uh, Sister Delara said, know, uh, know your audience. Um, I was going to <clears throat> Republican doors, Democrat doors, independent, I was going to all the doors. And I had one unifying message that everybody liked and that everybody could get on board with. What was that? What was that message? That message, well, well that's my secret, no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that message was transparency, bipartisanship solutions, finding common grounds and working together reaching across the aisle to get the job done. And it's not about, it's about people and what their issues and concerns are. And I wanna work with everybody in order to accomplish that. Because if I leave out anybody, um, I mean, if I leave out anybody, if, uh, there was a Democrat who came up to me and said, what are you doing? You have to vote party line every time. And you can't even say good morning. You, you can't even talk to Republicans. I was like, well, how am I going to serve my constituents if I can't even talk to Republicans? If I have somebody with a stormwater issue and their house is damaged, and I'm on stormwater, who are mostly Republicans, how do I how do I make that change? Right? You have to have the ability to sit down at the table, negotiate, and talk to people. You can't yell and scream, and that's not how good governance works. So. That is what I promised, and then this person said, well, we know you were campaigning on that issue and everything, but did you really mean that? We just, we just thought you were just saying that for the campaign. No, I promise what I deliver, and we have to promise what we say because we want to keep that integrity and, and those promises. And there were a lot of whisper campaigns. I had a lot of hurdles in front of me. That's why I had to walk to so many doors because from my own party, I had people going door to door saying, she's Muslim. 
she's Muslim. You don't want to vote. You want a Muslim in office. <coughs> and I found out that even within my own party, they and they did not want me. They wanted a Republican, even though they were Democrat. They'd rather have a Republican Trumper than a Muslim woman in office. <coughs> and it was surprising to them. They're still beating their heads against the wall. How did she get in? This was not supposed to happen. But you know, it's it's God's will, and um, it happened. And now I have to, for the next four years, I can't live in fear of criticism because I have four years to get the job done and do what I need to do. And no matter how much bullying I get or whatever, you know, as an elected official, I have to stand strong, and I have to do the right thing. Because if I waste my time in making friends and worrying about what people think about me, <coughs> I'm gonna look back at the four years and ask myself, what did I accomplish for the community, and how did I help? So we can't take that chance. <coughs> okay, we have. I'm just going to go in order. We have a question here. So, uh, and then, uh, yeah, uh, you you indicated that uh, we as a Muslim community uh, always voted for the actually currently still as you indicated for Republicans because our values align more towards the Republicans. Uh, Party. Uh, and from data, we talk about data for wisdom and science. Uh, are you seeing this shifting in the future? Uh, is that it indicated from the data? And if so, why? So I, I can personally say that at this stage, it boils down to the candidate and their passion. Because if you are the right candidate for the right position, people do see good in you. And so, so I looked at my data of my district. Uh, usually the Democrat District 3, which is Hinsdale, Burbage, Lyle, part of Clarendon Hills, and the whole entire uh, Downers Grove, thir three fourths of Downers Grove is in my district. And so I was not going in as a Muslim candidate. I was going in as a candidate who happens to be Muslim, who happens to have the doctorate degree, who happens to go against 10 years incumbent, who happens to bring the shed light to the, the numbers. And what happened at Makkah Center was very supportive of me. Initially, they, I, I hit the wall, but I kept at it. And finally, Imam pulled me aside and said, you know what, I think that uh, you're working really hard. I am going to be your advocate. And they started uh, spreading the message in the community. And finally, we had the yard signs in the community members. And even though this is a Monday morning quarterbacking, but still I came 2.3% short, then achieved that hurdle. So the so if, it ha so if there's a candidate behind me who happens to be Muslim, I think they will have an easier time because I will be there at their resource and I would be re ready to pave the way for the next future generation. But it is not going to happen overnight as we talked about. It is going to take at least uh, four election cycles, which is 16 years. Do we have the patience? That, 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 that has to show. Yeah. I just have a question. What tools did you use to get your data before you start doing what you so that you want to go into those. What tool? Oh, tools. um. I mean, what uh, software or whatever? Yeah. How did you get there? We have a database that we work with. Um, it was called Vote Builder. Vote Builder, Builder. minivan, and that's usually gets provided to the party, and a party decides to give it to the access <coughs> modular candidates, and that candidates give out those username and password to the. They can't. So there is a huge infrastructure. So now we are going into, again, nuts and bolts of it. No one tells you that the, how do you get the whole builder access? How do you get the minivan access? You start out with the names of people who you know, then you connect to the party, and then from party, you hope that someone graces you with that username and password. Fine. This uh, conversation in detail will happen in the next panel, which is nuts and bolts. So there are softwares available, yes. <laughs> to answer in short, there each district has data that will be provided to you. Um, one question is to bring it back to the, and I'll get back, I'll, I'll get to you, but um, one question because it is the local politics, which is the theme. Um, Sadie, you talked about how you've just recently been elected and how you're already having to make difficult decisions. So what is your thoughts on this? I had a first major vote um, in, uh, in my elected position uh, last Tuesday. And it was a very difficult, very difficult vote. Even though the issue was very simple. It was a very, very simple issue that people would think, what's the big deal? And um, I'm all about transparency, so I don't mind talking about it. Um, 
so the vote that we're supposed to have, um, and this is an example, and I'd like you to you know, take this as a learning experience. That's how I'm taking it. So the vote was on the committee assignments, and um, we had to vote either yes or no to approve committee assignments uh, for ourselves. Now we, we are seven Democrats, all women, and 11 Republicans, all men. And we are still in the minority. So I looked at the committee assignments, and we got six out of seven chairmanships uh, for Democratic women, which is really good. I was expecting like one, zero, or two. Um, we got more than five committees that were at least 50% or more majority Democrat. And on all the very important strategic committees, we had at least two to three Democrats in there. Um, and most of us got what we wanted. You know, I talked to everybody individually, my, my own team, and pretty much everybody got what they wanted except for a couple of people. Um, so I looked at this breakdown and I thought to myself, now, we have our first meeting. First of all, number one, as a Muslim, right? I mean, not getting religion into it, but the values of your faith, step one, is this fair? Is this just, right? You take your oath. The day of your inauguration, I took my oath. I took my oath as a lawyer, and I looked at it objectively. No bias. Is this fair? <coughs> yeah, I think it's pretty fair because we are still in the minority. We make up a uh, little well, 30% of the board, and we have 38% fairness and committee assignments. <coughs> so I thought it was pretty fair. And I'm not going to say it's not. If I vote against it, I'm saying that no, it wasn't fair, and we need changes. <coughs> And that would be un unjust to the other side. We're still looking at people as human beings, not as party lines anymore, as human beings. So <clears throat> I had a discussion with my, uh, with my team and a couple of key people, and I had indicated this then that I will be voting for the committee assignments. Now, they had a difference of opinion, which you will come across. People will have difference of opinion <coughs> for different reasons. Um, so. I wanted to vote my conscience, and the first day, I did. And I voted yes, while my the rest of my party, Democrats, voted no. So that put me in a very difficult position. I voted my conscience, and I voted what was right and just. I promised that I would deliver uh, bipartisanship uh, solutions and getting to the table. Now. There were little uh, arguments and disagreements on the floor and everything, as you see in other government bodies. Um, but you know, you really have to pick your battles because you still have to understand that you are the minority. So how are we going to get <coughs> the majority to come along with us? How are we going to work together to come to the table to negotiate and to move forward together? And that's the confidence we want to inspire in our constituents that government is working efficiently. So. so let me tease this out just a little bit because you explained the situation, but I want you to, to touch upon the, di the difficulty. So we understand that you broke from the other party, but what does difficulty mean? Okay, so how does it translate itself? Does it translate into them having meetings and not calling you or understanding that you're in a certain category that the other party members are not? What that, how does that manifest <coughs> for you? So that difficulty in any decision, there's so many different variables floating in your head. You have number one, for me, and I'll talk personally for me, uh, number one as a lawyer taking an oath, and then number two taking an oath as an elected official. Number three, uh, my own values and principles of fairness. And then you have your party. So the difficult part was, do you want to go against your party in doing something that you feel is right? Or do you want to do something that you feel is wrong just to go along with the party and to make people happy? How will you lead and what is your leading leadership style and how will you set the tone for the rest of your term and be consistent with that? We're going to have one last question, Brother Moon, and we have a time limit of the exchange included of a minute. Okay, so let's do a minute. Brother Moon, you want to ask you a question? Yeah, I have been basically debating and trying to find out the reasons of loss of our three uh, candidates, very wonderful candidates. Only one 
one, which is very great. What happened with the three people? I, I have my own hypothesis, and it looks like I might be wrong. So prove me wrong. One thing looks like the like Sadia in your case, and we can go and find out who raised the most amount of money. Did money play a role? And we have to learn that. That's why I'm raising, not putting you on the spot, Sadia. The second thing which I am thinking, and this is again my hypothesis, all these people ran, also Zara ran, and Zara and Ashley both ran together as twin sisters, and Zara lost. So it gives me a wrong idea that did name and be it our religion or anything was a factor, and your last name, Sadia, fortunately and unfortunately, I say fortunately, is covert. <laughs> covert. So most of the Republican, I say, as, as you indicated herself, that they were supporting, they supported you. So tell me these two things, where are those things? Because I'm sincerely, I need to know. Yeah. And I raised this point in the Democratic Party events, yeah. you know, very loudly. And I put them on, on, you can say, shame, that why our Muslim candidates were not pumped up, were not given, just paid off, does not work. I concur with you, because you have a valid point there with the name. However, I talked to Raja. Raja Krishnamurthy is a very long name, right? He won. And he won because sometimes you have to be strategic with your name and minimize something. He had commercials that call me Raja, call me Raja, call me Raja. He minimized his last name, Krishnamurthy. And I think um, as us, now I, my husband took me to Social Security <coughs> office two days after we got married. He's like, you're changing your name. <laughs> I mean, you know, and I'm, he's like, the invitation cards are gonna look weird, you know. Mr. and Mrs. Gold, Mr. and Mrs. Covert, we wanna be consistent. So that's my legal name. I didn't change my first name to Sadie. Some people suggested that. Why don't you go with Sadie? That's not my name. I'm Sadia. This is Hadia. This is Irfan, and this is Bushra. And we will not change our names just because you know, we want to fit in. Um, I think we could play around with our names a little bit, and we could maybe minimize it or be creative with it. But this is who we are. This is our identity, and we're going to have different names, and I think people are going to have to accept that in the future, and they will. The more they see their names, the more familiarity there will be. How did it impact it negatively on these three candidates? That I need to know. Okay. So I think the, the, I'm going to be very short. I, so uh, I, I personally think that it has a factor. There is no doubt about it. If you ask my constituents, they'll tell you that yes, if you live on Southside, Orland, Tinley, Orland Hills, they will tell you the same that what I factored. I think at this stage, I feel like I need to work harder. My uh, fourth grader told me that Dad Lincoln lost eight elections before he won presidency. Do you know that? <laughs> fourth grader. Uh, I came home and my daughter drew a picture while I was campaigning of herself, uh, my son, and my wife. And I said, where is Daddy? And, and she goes, he's at meeting. So these are the sacrifices we are making, there's no doubt about it, for one year. But I feel like we have to work harder, regardless of what your name is, we need to get beyond the name and the religion. We have to. And we have to show people we are the honest, true, courageous leaders, or the neighbors who are just doing to do the right thing and not trying to get on the gravy train. Can I share a story yes, that goes in with this? Um, so. I don't think my name played a factor. I come from a pretty progressive district and I ran against a Democratic incumbent who was also very progressive. So when it came to policy, it's like, all right, we're both on the same side now. Like, what do we do now? So I used it to my advantage to differentiate myself from him, share, sharing that I offered a different perspective. So if anything, it helped me, I would say. Um, but a week after my election, um, again, I lost my primary. Uh, the Democratic incumbent who was elected, his name's Larry. Larry and I, we got breakfast, okay? We're friends, first name basis. We get breakfast and he looks at me and he goes, you're gonna run for something else, right? And I was like, this is my wound. And you're like, going like this. <laughs> I was like, um, no. <laughs> I was like, I don't think so. I'm gonna be on the back end. Like, you know, inshallah, the Muslim vote comes out. I think I actually said inshallah too. He like looked at me. Um, but he's like, why? Like, why would you not run again? And he shared, he's like, my granddaughter is nine years old. So you have like 10 years on her, right? You're like 10 years older than her. But I hope in 10 years, 
she ends up just like you. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, so it shows that there are good people in politics, and he saw something in me despite being my opponent, and he encouraged me to run again. So now I'm running for a District 73 and a half school board with his support. You know, like he was like my election <laughs> so I don't, and I think that this is something that my name, race, you know, none of that had to do with it. It was, again, like I said, he said like being people, the <coughs> character, the Islamic values as Hadi mentioned that we hold, and sort of all of that tied into that, so. It was never gonna be easy. It was always gonna be an uphill battle, especially for first time candidates like mm -hmm. ourselves, yeah. who maybe weren't as entrenched in the area, who, you know, were community members, but weren't like, didn't have the name recognition, um, but I think you know we all did the best we could, and it's just about working uh, doubly as hard. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Okay, so we are going to have a question and answer session. Um, so we have Keith Ellison here. So. <laughs> He's deciding to go ahead and speak before he has lunch, so we're going to move forward with the program. I want to thank you.